This will continue the lecture on chapter 6 in the Barnett textbook on abused and abusive adolescence. Part 2 of this particular lecture, which uh, will be, I think, somewhat shorter than the first part, uh, deals with adolescents who have been abused or who abuse outside of the family. Oftentimes, uh, I will add that um, when we think about our social work role and whether or not we're approaching this problem from child protection and being a child protection worker, I tend to view these topics from that perspective. Um, this is an area, abuse outside the family, which generally does not involve child protection workers. It, it is usually matters referred to law enforcement. If you are working, however, in, in uh, shelters, for instance, whether it's children's shelters or women's shelters, um, any type of setting such as that, as well as in, in any kind of treatment with, with adolescents, substance abuse treatment, uh, mental health treatment, uh, inpatient or outpatient, um, as well as working with kids in the school. These issues are things that we really need to be sensitive about because these are things that are going on around us and uh, we need to be conscious uh, and cognizant of that. The women's shelter in, in, in my community will at times go out into the um, schools and will talk about dating violence and and uh, I believe it's um, kind of a given that kids a lot of times don't recognize uh, physical and sexual abuse in dating relationships as being abusive. Uh, there's a, a certain amount of acceptance of this that we'll be talking about uh, in a few slides down as to you know some of the reasons for that. But it's it's distressing and disturbing to realize that our own children in in their relationships could be victims. Um, perhaps even perpetrators of these kinds of things and, and not really see it that way. And so this is, a, this is a very sensitive and important topic to cover in this particular unit. As this th slide tells you, um, the best estimate, and, and the, this is, um, the research in this area is still pretty, pretty uncertain. You know, we don't really have n numbers nailed down really well, prevalence data and things like this, but the best estimate is that about one in 10 students nationwide suffer an injury caused by a boyfriend or a girlfriend. Boys tend to be perpetrating dating violence more often and are more violent when they do. Uh, and girls uh, conversely suffer more frequently victimization and suffer more severe injuries than boys. This is an issue that, that goes both ways. Again, girls do um, exhibit be, uh, violent behavior and do, and do perpetrate against boys in their relationships. However, there are different reasons for that that we're going to talk with here in a moment. But, but again, it's important to realize that girls usually suffer far more serious and more frequent injuries because of that than, than boys do. There are different reasons in the genders, uh, according to at least some of the studies you know that have been that have been conducted between boys and girls. So that girls, a lot of times, the violent behavior is about self-defense. Sometimes it's because of anger. Sometimes it's because the boyfriend has violated a rule or a value, you know, cheating on them or looking at other girls or things like that. For boys, um, they they uh, they claim a lot of times it's escalation prevention that they're holding the girls down to keep them from getting more violent. Um, uh, and also control is another big issue a lot of times in that. And there are other issues um, that, that contribute to uh, both sexes, but particularly boys, I think, in, in terms of violence in, in their relationship that we're going to touch on in a, mat in a minute. And there are certain factors in dating violence that I think that risk factors that increase the possibility of dating violence. And certainly not in every every relationship, but among those relationships that are prone to violent behavior, these kinds of factors are, are going to increase the possibility of it occurring. And this, of course, is drug and alcohol use, anything that kind of lowers their inhibitions, uh, inability to manage anger, poor social skills, uh, you know, associations with, with violent individuals, um, the tendency to, to resolve conflict through violent means, those types of things. And, and persons who are victimized, um, in dating violent relation or violent dating relationships are at increased risk for behaviors or for things like binge drinking, suicide attempts, physical fights, and and other sexual activity. These are these are things that are um, um, associated at, as occurring at higher at higher rates among victims of dating violence. 
and uh, as a response to dating violence, sometimes victims uh, use this wishful thinking, particularly girls, that it's not going to happen again. Very similar to the kinds of dynamics that we'll see when we talk about interparental violence um, uh, in a few weeks. Um, something that needs to be confronted and dealt with, but uh, but wishful thinking is one of those things that's often the first response. Um, so, but but other adolescents sometimes take stronger action, like uh, breaking up with the individual or fighting back or reporting the abuse to others. When they're involved, sometimes parents aren't very helpful and uh, have been known to encourage um, their children to kind of forgive this and, and look at the more positive things in a relationship. And it, it's interesting, and this is an area here where friends tend to be a better support than than parents, and in, in sometimes in this situation. However. <clears throat> The difficulty with that is is that friends oftentimes do not have the resources to do anything about it. Parents might, and so that's an area that I think uh, is ripe for intervention for future uh, purposes. You know, is is educating parents about how to respond to this kind of thing when when your child shows signs or symptoms or or brings concerns about dating violence to you. One of the things, one of the, the contributors to dating violence is, is a hypersensitivity to rejection. Those, those adolescents who are hypersensitive to rejection are more likely to be aggressive in their dating relationships. It's, it's almost like a, um, a sort of a dependent kind of a, of a thing. And if you go back to uh, some humanistic psychology, you know, I think it was uh, Rollo May talked about love. And, and if I remember correctly, uh, he, it was May who talked about be love, which was being love, and D love, which was deficiency love. Be love, being love, is is a is a love for each other based upon who the other person is, and and um, you want to be with that person because you like what that person has to offer and how that person acts and the qualities of that individual. Whereas um, in a deficiency love, you stay with uh, another individual because there are certain things that they do for you. They give you, they fill in certain voids in your life. And so you, I think you can get the difference there. So of course the D love, the deficiency love, is the one that's going to be marked more with jealousy and dependency and certainly is the least stable of the two types of love relationships. And so here you have kids that are involved in a deficiency-based uh, relationship, most likely, and the, the adolescent who's hypersensitive to rejection um, feels any kind of threat uh, to the stability of their relationship as something that's a rejection of himself or herself, and so it can become more violent even in anticipation of that rejection. And there's different explanations for dating violence. Of, you know that uh, you know there's violence in family of origin um, that. Um, as children, they've been shamed or rejected a lot more, um, that there's dysfunction in the family that they come from that, that uh, endorses violence, perhaps, or, or doesn't uh, provide proper supervision. Attachment issues. Uh, oftentimes, this goes back again to sort of this deficiency love thing. Um, you're really looking at, at individuals who have insecure attachments, had insecure attachments probably with their parents at a very young age and are carrying that forward now in, in their in their intimate relationships as they begin to mature into uh, older individuals. Um, we socialize our girls to accept male control, patriarchy, and uh, this this kind of notion that love is everything and conquers all. Love is the reason to be together. Uh, that that uh, whole belief system <clears throat> causes so many problems in in marriages and in interpersonal relationships, intimate relationships. Uh, but that's a whole other class, in fact. Males are socialized. Uh, well, first of all, anything female, anything feminine is threatening and dangerous. That mis misogynistic kind of sense that to be feminine or to be female is bad. Um, and and also that to be violent is and sexual I will add is something that makes one more of a man. And there are peer influences on dating violence. You know who you hang with and what they have to say about about how to respond to problems in your relationships and the different media influences. You know concerns about video games and television and things that viewing violence may stimulate violence in interpersonal relationships. Those are very controversial studies and uh, they're mentioned in the book. You know, but uh, that's something to be considered of. And all fifty states have laws to protect adults from domestic violence, but those laws do not necessarily protect adolescents. 
the CDC in 2005 uh, conducted a study that said, well, over a third of females and 28% of males experienced, um, this is what it's called, their first rape victimization. So this would be, you know, their first uh, coerced sexual act, I suppose, between the ages of 12 and 17. A third, of, a little more than a third of females and almost a third of males. Um, the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly report in 2008 conducted a study indicated that 11% of girls and uh, about 4 or 5% of boys between the age, grades 7 and 12 have reported instances of forced sexual intercourse at one time or another. The, of course, uh, sexual abuse among dating partners is something that that has consequences in many different areas in life and and it's a very strong risk factor for victimization in young adolescence is mental health problems uh, but the most predictive interpersonal dimension of sexual assault was again this thing about rejection sensitivity that uh, fear of an anticipation perhaps of being rejected and there are certain legal issues related to uh, sexual assault for instance the age of consent this is the age at which uh, the law deems an individual a person um, of proper age to consent to sex. In the state of Alaska, that's 16. And so anybody under the age of 16 is not considered to be old enough legally to, to consent to sex. And then the laws also from state to state have uh, varying prescriptions um, <clears throat> about the differences in age between sexual partners when one of them is below the age of consent as to when it becomes a legal um, a law violation when not. There isn't much prosecution um, in any area in any state of female to male sexual assault and that has a lot to do with the mythology we have around masculinity and in, in, in traditional upbringing in the Western culture. Um, sexting is another thing and um, uh, again without having uh, going into this in great detail I mean you know this thing of sending um, you know lurid photographs over by way of text messages and things like that is that a, is that a law violation or not uh, um, all sorts of things you know is that is that does that create new victims of course it does in some cases so this is this is an area of uh, we'll we'll be hearing more about in the years ahead some studies suggest that dating violence and sexual assault occur more frequently among same-sex youth than among those youth in relationships with somebody from the opposite sex. Um, it's kind of an interesting statistic. And the victimization of gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgendered youth uh, uh, is higher than than those not uh, than the heterosexual youth. Uh, by these rates, uh, eighty percent of um, GLBT youth indicate that they've been verbally abused. Eleven percent physically abused. Nine percent sexually abused. And males report higher victimization rates than females among this population. One of the things that tends to work against heterosexism and, and abuse of uh, of, uh, th of this population is to have an acquaintance or friend who's a homosexual and, and getting to know the individual and their individual needs and wants and to see that they're just like everyone else's and this is the thing that kind of humanizes that and, and uh, um, gay lesbian bisexual youth no longer seem to be characterizations or or anything like this but real human beings who deserve respect policies in school that encourages inclusiveness uh, help also to lower rates of harassment um, and and it's noted in the text as well that medical providers never ask teen providers about same-sex rela uh, same sex violence I should say they just don't do it and and um, youths don't tend to disclose anything about their sexual orientation to healthcare professionals either <clears throat> as a provider who is working with adolescents in the years ahead no matter what your relationship what what the agency setting is where you work with them whether it's in the, it could be in the hospital might be area keep in mind that these are areas that tend to be avoided and it might be helpful to uh, to see if it's possible to address these uh, these areas in your contact with youth treatment prevention should start in middle school early adolescence because the risk for dating and violence increases with age and the earlier you begin to uh, explode these notions of traditional masculinity and femininity femininity and and define proper relationships and how they should be the better off it's going to be the less violence will occur among the youth in particular um, adolescent girls uh, 
could use a lot of help in, in being able to identify the signs of abusive partners. You know, what makes what what's a high risk individual for abuse and things like, you know, somebody who's overly jealous or protective or possessive. Battery intervention programs can work with uh, youth at this age group uh, if it's focused upon the adolescent population. Peer counselors can be useful for abused adolescents. And there are different areas legally uh, that need some need to be addressed in order to uh, be more effective in this in this particular field. Um, protective order laws, which are in existence to help adult females deal with uh, intrusive and abusive. Um, in other adults in intimate relationships, it isn't there for teens, and so uh, these laws need to include the realities of teen relationships and give teens an opportunity to use these, to use this method. And and it's also suggested that teens should not be required to disclose to adults in order to get the protection of the law. Um, um, and in fact, uh, adults get legal advocates a lot of times when they go into court as uh, with restraining orders, and and uh, those legal advocates should be made available to the teen victim as well. Abusers under 18 do need to be held accountable. They may be children, they may be youth, and they may have a bright future ahead of them, but that future will be clouded if we don't have effective and meaningful interventions. And, and part of that intervention with any abuser, sexual, physical, whatever, has to include accountability to be effective. And, and uh, confidentiality in dealing with youth because of the fact that it's a juvenile record, all those kinds of things, and, and whether or not parents are involved, uh, those kinds of issues all need to be addressed by the courts. In the end, interventions from a very early age have to be clear. Physical violence is totally unacceptable. In closing, this particular segment, just a few things about people who are re-victimized and, and, and because oftentimes your victims do come back despite your interventions or if if they had no interventions, they're, they're coming to you for the first time after a series of victimizations. And, and understanding the dynamics of re-victimization is, is really very central to the topic of family violence. Um, and, and a quote in the text that I particularly like said that an especially widespread and disturbing finding is that any victimization in childhood is likely to increase the likelihood of continued victimization in adolescence and young adulthood. And and this kind of goes on to, to the, the final uh, quotation here, experiencing violence transforms people into victims and changes their lives forever. Once victimized, one can never again feel quite as invulnerable. And so this this explains a little bit about the re-victimization and why it is that, uh, well, when when you've been victimized once, the world changes and and um, nothing is really quite the same after that. So that will end this week's lecture, and I hope that you find the the information helpful to you. If you have any questions, please do contact me, and uh, I'll do my best to answer them for you. And otherwise, I'll talk to you again next week.